All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks for hanging out with us. I know there's an open bar right next door. Um, and I just want to say that this talk is going to share some personal stories. Um, so whatever happens in this room, I know it's not going to stay in this room. But the good news is that your Q&A session will be private. It will not be recorded. So if you have any personal questions on these topics, do not worry. You are not being recorded. And if you feel awkward about doing that, we'll also we'll be in the hallway for a good 20 minutes afterwards so we can help you guys out. Um, so before we begin, I just want to say that overall in InfoSec we all work really long hours and not just that, we work all the time because that is security. It's all hours. And because of that we all run into depression, uh, burnout, and as well as anxiety. So I'm going to let my wonderful panelists next to me introduce themselves. I'll start. Uh, I'm Susan Pediacle. I am here as a representative of Mental Health Hackers. I am their chief wellness officer. That just means that I teach a lot of yoga for them. Uh, but I'm a board member, and it's been great so far. And I'll tell you more about the organization later. Uh, by trade, I'm a threat intelligence analyst. So I'm in the cyber community for about 15 years now. Hello, everyone at B-Sides. This is actually my first B-Sides SF, so it's a great group out here. So uh, thanks so much. I've seen you guys on Twitter, so it's been really great. So you guys are doing really great things. So really happy that everyone took the time out this afternoon to uh, think about yourself and mental health and what it means to be well in this uh, hacker's world. Uh, my name is Ryan Louie. I'm a board-certified psychiatrist. I work with a medical group called Vituity. And I actually work in a hospital right here in San Francisco in between Knob Hill and Tenderloin at the St. Francis Memorial Hospital in the psychiatric unit. It. And I've been really interested in just working with different people from uh, different walks of life, different backgrounds, and here in this uh, this room here, hackers and cybersecurity and about mental health. So I think we could have a great conversation together. Uh, my name is Chloe Mistagi. I'm the VP of Strategy over at Point3 Security. I'm also the founder of Women Hackers and the co-founder of uh, WOSEC, Women of Security. And I am so happy to be here today because Mental Health Hackers is one of those organizations that every single person in the space should know about. And so we get to touch on that a little bit later. But first, I think we need to talk about what we're actually dealing with. I did mention that we work all hours. I mean, sometimes we'll be working at two, three, and the weekends, and burnout is really prevalent. And what ends up happening is that we're basically also self-medicating ourselves. Many of us are drinking, some of us are doing drugs, some of us are doing risky behaviors, and some of us use food as a way to protect ourselves or to help us cope. And I'm really happy to have Ryan here who can actually share a little bit more on the medical side of things so we can share a little bit more about the truths out there about mental health. Ryan, it's up to you, sir. Mm -hmm. So uh, first of all, I just want to let everyone know that uh, deep down, mental health is not just something for a certain profession or a group. It's not just for psychiatrists. It's not just for people who are trained in mental health. It's actually everybody. Because deep down, everyone already has it in his or her own DNA. And, and if you think back to mental health and what it means for you, just think back to your own experiences and think about how it made you feel, how it made you think. What kind of actions uh, did you take? Just kind of reflect on that. And everyone has the permission to do it themselves. So, so keep an open conversation. So in terms of uh, mental health, just as a general background, you can tell from the slide that it's super, super common. I'm sure that maybe someone has, uh, is very likely to have known someone with a mental health condition, uh, maybe even uh, ourselves or with a friend or a family or a colleague. And it's a very, very, very common. And oftentimes it starts very early in, in life. Uh, sometimes it happens in middle age and sometimes older, uh, Older people get it also, so there's a wide spectrum, but uh, very common, and um, and oftentimes being aware of it and detecting it early and doing something about it is what it's all about too. Oftentimes people talk about stress, and uh, maybe some of uh, you in the audience have seen this curve. It's actually made over a hundred years ago, called the Yerkes Dodson curve, uh, uh, and they talked about this idea of like there's different levels of stress and different types of stress uh, overall meaning that if you see on your left side that if it's not stressful enough it gets kind of boring you know it's like oh, it's the same old same old you know they could do the job probably do it pretty well but it's not really that fun 
And then when you kind of ramp up the stress a little bit, you get kind of like in the, the, the middle zone where you kind of feel, yeah, you know, it's pretty stressful and it was challenging and it was hard. And, uh, you know, we, we stayed up pretty late and, uh, you know, uh, went through some hard times, but overall, I think it was good. It was a good, it was a good time. We learned a lot. You felt you grew as a team, grew as a person. And then as you start getting towards the right side, you get into the bad stress, and that's when stuff starts uh, going downhill. You start noticing that, you know, you're not feeling yourself, you're not feeling like the work is worth it, and just overall not, not feeling that good. So um, Chloe and Susan have been very kind to uh, share some uh, stories, of, of both personally and the things that they've seen, and I'll also share some things that I've that I've seen as well. But maybe we could launch by uh, going into the uh, the field of anxiety. Yeah. All right, you're looking at me, so I will start. Um, recently, you probably maybe saw that I wrote an article for a Tripwire talking about openly about having anxiety. So myself in 2011, I experienced my first panic attack and it was the scariest thing in my life. I'm not going to lie. I literally thought I was dying and I didn't know what was going on. And so basically ever since then, I think for about a good four years, I would have a panic attack every single month. And every time I did, I saw the symptoms, which was the tingling sensation in my toes and going a little bit higher up. And that's when I realized I'm going to curl up in a ball and I'm going to put my timer on for eight minutes because I figured it out that if I put the timer on for eight minutes, I know this is just a panic attack and I'm going to be okay. So I would set my timer for eight minutes, curl up in a ball and think of as many positive things and reinforcing the idea that once again, I'm having a panic attack. Now, the issue with that was that during this time, I was scared to go out and about because I didn't know when it was going to hit. So imagine you're like in a crowd like this and then suddenly like you start feeling this sensation. You're like, I can't breathe. What are you going to do? You go to the restroom where everyone else is in there. I mean, at RSA, as a woman, maybe you won't have anyone in the restroom, but here there's a good amount of people. And it was really hard, and I realized what was happening was it was based over control. Because when I was little, I planned everything to the T. I was like, at the age of 23, I'm going to do the following things. At the age of 25, I'm going to do the following things. And you know what happens? It doesn't happen, and then that's when you start having the panic attacks. And that was one of the lessons that I definitely learned. So I'm pretty sure this slide is me right now, <laughs> um, being on a panel at Besides SF and um, having anxiety. It's, it's apropos. But uh, being at cons in general, I think that they're slightly anxiety inducing. There's so many people. And it's a sensory overload almost, which is, again, why Mental Health Hackers uh, does what it does and tries to provide a chill out room at, at conferences when it's invited. Um, and then also, from personal experience, I think the time I feel anxiety the worst is usually when it's there's like an impending deadline. Um, and you just want to make sure it's the perfectionist in me. Um, I want to make sure I'm turning in like the perfect product, the perfect deliverable. And uh, it's probably like the worst experience until I finally hit send and it's gone. And there's nothing I can do about it then. So I'm, I'm sure we all have. Uh, there's hundreds of examples I can give you right now. But yeah, keep it short. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, uh, Susan and Chloe. I mean, a lot of these things that uh, you've described is, I'm sure everyone kind of has felt some part of that at some point in their life. And it's, uh, it's anxiety can be a normal response to stress. It protects us, so lets us know that there's bad things out there and then we gotta be careful and just kind of avoid it or deal with it. It kind of keeps us alert. But when anxiety becomes kind of like a, a, a more serious kind of thing, it's then when it becomes somehow out of proportion to what would be uh, appropriate for either that situation or the stage in life of a person or the context of it so it's a it's a it's kind of a, a, a scale almost and um, and uh, anxiety disorders are super common so uh, lots of uh, lots of lots of people are can be affected by it uh, several different types of uh, anxiety and uh, and on the internet and different uh, uh, sources uh, there's a lot of information there so uh, you know, just just as an example for educational purposes you know there's different types of anxiety there's uh, panic disorders there's um, there's uh, generalized anxiety disorders where there's anxiety about things in general and and, and, and broad things then you get into things like uh, social anxiety disorders uh, where where there's uh, social situations that 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 cause uh, 
the uh, anxious feelings and and things of that nature. Then you have the, all the different kind of phobias, uh, and uh, and oftentimes uh, we've heard in the media about various phobias, and and there's constantly new ones. So, uh, but all of them have this element of of anxiety. And then finally, there's a uh, uh, anxiety that's oftentimes caused by things that are beyond uh, uh, mental health or psychiatry, um, things to do with uh, substances like drugs, or alcohol, either medical conditions. And finally, there's other uh, things that are related to anxiety, such as PTSD and what we call adjustment disorder, meaning that there's something that happened and people are trying to adjust the best that they can to take care of this. So I listed on the right side of the slide just various kind of symptoms, and I'm sure these are, are very familiar to everyone who's ever felt panicked or, or anxious, essentially, uh, the queasiness, sweating, palpitations, feeling uneasy, don't feel like eating, you know, can't sleep, all that kind of stuff. So... And uh, just a brief uh, educational slide about treatment. The most important thing is to is to find someone that you trust. Find someone that you trust, and and don't be afraid to go out and reach out and get some help. Uh, this could be a, a close friend, a close colleague, uh, a mentor, someone that you could go to say, hey, you know, there's there's something going on. I I want someone to talk to about this kind of thing. And uh, and and maybe uh, after speaking and self reflecting. Get this, uh, take the step to seek a, a professional. It could be a mental health professional, a physician, and get, get, get a check so that you could make sure that you're not missing anything that could be more serious. And they could work with you to find a program that's uh, appropriate for people um, in terms of their lifestyle and what they, what, they, what they like to do. And you know, there's lots of different tips on how to uh, uh, handle anxiety. And the, the general thing I like to tell people is find something that you uh, feel that you could do on your own, that you can feel happy about, that you feel satisfying, and that you feel personally rewarding. Because deep down, that's what's going to keep you going when things get tough. You want to be able to make sure that you could do the things that you enjoy. And of course, uh, you know, get, get people involved. Uh, get, get people that you trust involved. Get, get doctors and physicians on board and, uh, and uh, get it all comprehensively uh, uh, moving forward. Okay. Then we're going to talk about some depression. Guess I'm going first again. Um, okay, so I've never been clinically depressed. And so what I've gone through is episode depression, which is from an event that occurs in your life where suddenly you get depressed if symptoms of depression. Um, for me, I had a breakup with someone that I loved so much and it hurt me really bad. And a week later, I lost my job. So I was a complete... I was just a disaster in a sense. Like I was crying like every single day. I was putting on weight, trying to like put some sort of barrier around me some way. And it was just crying a lot. And no one knew about it because I was also being very productive, also looking for a new job. So that lasted for like months on end. Maybe I should have gone first because she took my answer. <laughs> um, but no, it's very much the same where I think anytime I've ever felt depression, it's always been event driven. Um, and I always felt very selfish for labeling it as depression. Um, I felt like I shouldn't do that because I know people in my life who have been uh, diagnosed with depression, manic depressive. Um, and like Chloe said, it's all usually... Uh, you're still high functioning, you're still uh, seemingly normal until you go home and you're on the floor. Um, and uh, it's always been like breakups or a, a job related, <laughs> um, having some sort of failure at work, um, family induced. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it could be any of those things, but I'll leave it to Ryan to talk about uh, actual depression, like the symptoms and everything. Yeah, Chloe and uh, Susan brought up a great point in that uh, the idea of depression, there's always going to be some points in life uh, definitely that, you know, people feel down. There's going to be ups and downs for sure. And oftentimes people ask, you know, hey, is this like actual depression or are we just feeling depressed or just feeling kind of stressed? Like, how does this all kind of work? Uh, in, 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 in many cases, uh, it's, uh, we have a common language in psychiatry to clinically diagnose something. But in actuality, it's all the same biology. We are all the same molecules. We're all the same uh, uh, cells inside our body. And uh, it's, a, it's a gray zone, actually. Uh, 
to be able to say like, you know, what's uh, kind of like okay stress and what's kind of like super stressful and what's clinically, you know, clinically serious, it's oftentimes a, a gradation. And to be able to know where each person is in terms of his or her own life and what feels right and what doesn't feel right, I think each of us knows ourselves the best. So just kind of keep that in mind and keep an open mind towards uh, uh, being aware of oneself and we could uh, uh, get places. So, but in terms of psychiatrists and then people in the mental health field, in terms of what actually depression is, that is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual called the DSM-5. And it's the manual of all the clinical diagnoses. So, uh, you know, we have a criteria that, that, that are used to actually diagnose depression. So I'll, I'll leave this up here on the, on the slide for everyone to read. But essentially it's stuff like, don't feel like hanging out with people. Don't feel like uh, doing things for fun. Um, feeling kind of guilty, not just guilty, but uh, inappropriately guilty, maybe too much guilt about stuff that happens. It feels like, you know, you don't want to, uh, you know, hang out with people. If you're having problems concentrating, you're, you're fine, like you're eating too much or either too little. Same for sleep, sleeping too much, sleeping too, too little, hard to get out of bed, hard to get started. These are some of the things that people kind of describe. And um, feeling depressed for most of the day. And uh, sometimes even getting to the point of having thoughts of self-harm or, or maybe even suicide. And, uh, and that's, when, that's when things um, uh, get very serious and it's time to look out for each other and ourselves to try to get some help. And uh, similarly, the symptoms, uh, some of these are, are, are physical manifestations, like in terms of what our bodies feel when, when, when we get depressed. And, um, and again, oftentimes these are felt in other kind of mental health conditions as well. They kind of overlap with anxiety and, and depression, but it all points to the fact that we're human bodies, uh, we're, we're human beings. And uh, everything that affects us in one uh, part of our mental health oftentimes kind of leaks over to other things. So um, uh, again, we talk about things like uh, uh, feeling feeling um, uh, depressed and down overall. So I'll leave this up. And, uh, and I think these slides will, will be available for people. And certainly you can contact us and we'll send you a copy. So. And treatment-wise, um, uh, overall, uh, it's, it's the idea of don't, don't do it alone. That's the general message. Um, you know, find someone you trust, uh, get, a, get the help of a professional, get a, a, go see a counselor, a therapist, someone that you could talk to just so that you're not by yourself, so that you got people around you, you got a team, just like here at B-Sides, you know, no one's doing cybersecurity or uh, hacking and things like that. No one's doing it by themselves, you know, although it's an individual endeavor, deep down, it's a community effort. So that's, you think about everyone in this room, everyone's sitting here, so this is what we do. We all, we all do it together. And uh, the things at the bottom are when we talk about when things get really serious in terms of uh, danger to self, danger, uh, self-harm. So these are certain uh, some of the, the flags that we could look out for ourselves or to our, for our colleagues in terms of, you know, what to look out for. And uh, things like wanting to end things, maybe getting things organized, preparing for things, uh, maybe by their, their change in their behavior and uh, maybe their outlook or the way they do things and, and the way they, they say things. So, um, so just kind of looking out for everyone. To continue with the talk about suicide, I think many of us have lost someone in InfoSec because of suicide. And it's really important to talk about that there's two different types of suicide and usually we don't really know about this. The first one is an active thought. An active thought is like today, next week, next month, next year, I'm gonna take this many pills on this one day and I'm gonna end it all. Now, another one, it could be sudden where you're like, you look for a blade, you see it, and you're like, I, I can't do this anymore. Like, this is it, I've had thoughts, this is the time to do it. That is one of those things that is an active moment. Now, there are suicidal tendencies and passive thoughts. Passive thoughts can be, um, anything from I am going to not look in my rear window, or I mean my mirror, and I'm just going to go and merge into the online. And if I get hit, I hit, I get thrown, and I die. And this is great for me because I don't want to do this anymore. Um, another thing could be not looking when crossing the street. These are other ways to spot suicidal thoughts. And I'm pretty sure that most of us at some point in our life know someone who has gone through something like this or ourselves as well. We're going to move into the era of burnout. And uh, when Susan and Chloe showed me the slide, uh, you know, in terms of InfoSec, I was like, wow, is that just three years going from baby Yoda to like master Yoda? 
and like to <laughs> be a Jedi master. But uh, but overall, it, it points to the general idea that there's this thing called burnout. And uh, essentially, you know, let's talk about what burnout is. You know, I think everyone kind of knows uh, to some degree, like you know, what 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 it sort of feels like in terms of burnout. I kind of liken it to this: like when your cell phone battery, like for me, let's say I'm tweeting a lot, and then it, it you know it goes down to ten percent, five percent, three percent. Oh oh, starts turning red, starts blinking, stuff. This the, the, the screen starts to dim, and then I can't do other functions. I everything runs really slow, and it's it gets the, my phone suddenly knows that that they just need to preserve the most basic things, make phone calls, send messages, and somehow get whatever data if we can. Something like that, you know. We gotta make the most of what's going on. So uh, for burnout, it's when the energy is essentially all drained out. Uh, emotional depletion is uh, is one of the features. It's the idea that um, just drained. It's the it's a flashing red icon on your cell phone. Detachment and cynicism. Oftentimes, people start making off-color jokes and making comments about uh, different things at work, or or about or about uh, life in general, or about different problems. And then it starts to become uh, uh, something noticeable that they're kind of detached from their work. Low personal achievement. It's the idea that hey, you know, this when I first joined, this this job was really fun. I was really excited, want to do great things in the world and uh, build my career and and kind of go forward. But after a while, it's it kind of levels off a little bit, and maybe even kind of goes down downhill in terms of like, hey, it's, uh, it's not what I thought it was anymore. And then depersonalization, it's the idea that it's not connected to you as a person anymore. Some people describe it as like looking at yourself in a film or looking at yourself as if you were an exhibit at a museum or something like that. So all these things are, 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 are signs of burnout. And interestingly, burnout is not part of that DSM-5 manual that I talked about. It's actually a, a, a condition that's not officially a, a psychiatric illness, but some people think that it's on its way to depression. But whatever it is, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's affecting people's lives. And, uh, oh, so I was oh, going to yeah. interrupt. Sorry. So we were going to share personal stories about this. <laughs> and I, I really wanted to make sure I uh, spoke on this one because this is the one that I experienced most recently. So um, I was with a consulting company. I'm, I'm not working right now for this reason, for burnout specifically. So I was with a consulting company for 14, year, or 14 months. Jesus, 14 years. Um, and um, that whole 14 months, I didn't have a single vacation. I didn't have a day off. Um, I took three weeks off to go do my reserve duty, and they counted that as my time off when I asked for time off. They were like, well, you just took three weeks off. And I'm like, to go serve in the reserves? I mean, that's not really sitting on the beach with a drink in my hand. So um, I tried to ignore it, kept trying to ignore it. I was like, let me just make it to one year, made it to one year. Uh, had pro uh, I was on a client, had a project going on. I was like, okay, let me just make it to the end. And um, my body, Ryan talked about physical manifestations, and my body was just not going to let it happen anymore. So come July, I was having a migraine every single day. Um, it's just literally, as soon as I woke up in the morning, it was migraine. Um, and I kept ignoring it, took my migraine medicine. Um, later on, about a week later, I developed a facial twitch. And um, I went to the doctor and I was like, I can't get this to stop. And he was like, that's because you're about to either have Bell's palsy or um, have a stroke. So that was the day that I put in my two weeks notice and I quit my job. Um, and I have no regrets about it. I knew that it was the right thing to do. I had the support of my friends and family. When I tell people about it, they're like, good for you. Um, it was just something that was necessary and I needed to... I, that was one of the reasons why I really wanted to make sure I spoke today, because I was like, it's just something that we want to keep pushing through and ignoring. But after a while, like, you just can't anymore. That uh, uh, picture was literally me. <laughs> so, um, Chloe, I don't know if you have any. Um, so in, before I went into InfoSec, I was in humanitarian work, and then it also included education. I was placed in Oakland, a school district, to work with special ed kids, and I was not trained. I had kids that were being prostituted at the age of like eight or nine. I had kids that were being stabbed multiple times, like in other places of their bodies, so it wouldn't anyone would be able to notice it. I was dealing with kids that saw someone get murdered in front of them, and I was not trained for this. And I remember just being so burned out because not only that, but people quit all the time in special ed in Oakland because there's no resources for you, and you're like, where did the money go? Um, and the thing is, is that with that burnout people leave, and then you take on their cases. So suddenly I was, had 12 kids, and then suddenly it went up to 42, and I was not doing good. And if you heard a little bit earlier about being in, in a car and you're looking in a mirror, you're like, well, what happens if I just don't look when going to the other lane? And that was the moment that I realized, like, 
okay, I'm burned out, I need to get out, this is not good for me if I'm having these type of thoughts. And yeah, the same thing, you recognize it, but sometimes it's too late, and it's really important to recognize that now. Yeah, and the, and, and, and the idea of recognizing it now, doing something now, that's so important. Like everyone here is at this session, as you, it's the last day of a B-Sides SF. Uh, reflect on the people that you've met here. To reflect on the sessions that you've been, the ideas that you're thinking about, and, and think about what this means for you and, and where you like to be. Checking in with yourself constantly is a, it's a great place to start. So uh, that's how we could start to tackle these uh, ideas and things. Um, I, I believe in the power of stories. I think Susan and Chloe have have, have, have shared very powerful stories uh, with everyone. Uh, I'll just leave this slide up, uh, just general physical si signs and symptoms of burnout, things to do with behavior, emotional signs. But I think overall, uh, from the stories that we've heard, uh, I, think, I think that encapsulates very well uh, about this idea of what it means to feel when you feel burned out. Oftentimes people talk about what's the difference between stress and burnout. And uh, this is a slide that uh, we got off the, the internet there, but, uh, but in general, sometimes it's kind of gray and sometimes it's kind of hard. There's no delineation in terms of stress and burnout. Oftentimes uh, one goes on to the other side and the other one comes on the other side. Uh, but in general, uh, stress, as we talked about that curve, there could be good stress, bad stress, everything in between kind of stress. When it becomes burnout is when you, when you start hitting that red battery. So the red battery, flashing battery, got to do something. So. And uh, there's different types of uh, things that can cause burnout. They could be caused by things at the workplace. That's the most common things that uh, people hear about that, uh, that causes uh, uh, burnout and stress. Things like not having control over your work, having not given enough resources to do the work you've been assigned to, uh, dynamics between colleagues, and just really stressful, high pressure kind of environments. It could also be caused by lifestyle kind of things, like maybe things in terms of not being able to turn off when you go back home. Like, you know, you're clocked out, you're done with your shift, but then you're back at home when you should be enjoying stuff with your family, but then yet you're thinking about work and checking your phone and and uh, and trying to do stuff like that. Sometimes it's, uh, it's built into each of us and uh, we talked about that idea that everyone's different and everyone has a different level of threshold uh, for what stress is good and what's bad and sometimes this could be uh, built into our own DNA our own personality so being aware of that and what works for us and what doesn't is oftentimes a big step to go forward and again treatment um, in general it's it's again don't do it by yourself. You know, just go out and find some people that you trust. Go out and get some uh, uh, help um, and then talk about what might be needed, different things that we could treat, not just burnout, but also depression, anxiety. Sometimes it could be used, uh, uh, there could be medications for, for, for treatment. Sometimes it's talk therapy. Sometimes it's a combination of both. And oftentimes we try to look for the underlying cause. So just solve the underlying cause. Try to, try to find into that. And, uh, and there's a whole, whole bunch of different kind of uh, ways to manage symptoms. So I'll leave this up for everyone to take a look at it. But uh, generally, find people that you trust. Find a, a group of people that can help you out. Do something that you enjoy, that you feel you could do on your own, uh, just out of enjoyability. And keep moderation in, in, in terms of uh, things that you do. And always keep tabs on yourself to, to understand where you are. I think this whole presentation, we're trying to show that you should never go through anything alone. I mean, we are a community of people that like, we have many of our DMs are open and we're always trying to help each other out. And I think that's one of the things that keeps us in this room and keeps us going to B-Sides SF. It, it's, it's the community and we need to be part of that. And just note that like, it's very hard to talk openly about your situation, but there's plenty of people out there that are willing to look into you and help you out. Oh, anytime you want. Sorry, dry throat. Uh, next one. Honestly, I think the industry needs to change. We need to be a little bit more open about these things and also to have open dialogue. The other thing is that, you know, we usually treat anything with a health concern pretty well, so like a broken leg, diabetes, but we never really do anything when it comes to people that are dealing with like depression, anxiety, and PTSD and whatnot. And that's one of the things that we really need to talk about because it does impact us in our everyday work at the same time. And we're still going through the stigmatisms that come with mental health as well. 
So like I was saying, share your experiences is going to be really important. But also what you can do is reach out to the resources that we're going to share towards the end. And also note that you can actually build a support network yourselves, too, to help each other. So everyone has someone that they can call when they need someone to talk to. Now, changing the workplace, like I said earlier, if someone has a broken leg, you take that seriously. You're like, you can stay home. You can't walk. It's totally fine. But we should also do that when people are dealing with some things and mentally. And that's one of the things that we need to change because a lot of us, when we're going through something, we don't tell HR, we don't tell our manager because we're kind of where we're going to get fired. Let's be real. And that's a real problem. But the other thing is that if we don't say anything, then we might get, end up getting fired because we are dealing with something and we're not getting the right treatment that we need. So just remember that, is that if a company is not going to help you out at all, you shouldn't be working there, period. And before we actually basically announced that we're going to be doing this talk, we started doing research ourselves and we asked the community, do you have any employer that has helped you with your mental health? We got zero responses. And that's just letting you know, the problem is very real. And we are definitely being overworked. And especially when someone leaves our team, we're taking on more work. And we're not being respected or appreciated. So this is why it's really important. If you're a manager in this room, please push something forward. This is really important to do. So I uh, wanted to give you some quick facts about mental health in the workplace to uh, go off of what Chloe just said. Um, depression and anxiety have a significant economic impact. The estimated cost globally um, is $1 trillion per year uh, in lost productivity due to mental illness. Um, work is good for mental health, but being in a negative work environment can lead to physical and mental health problems like we've already illustrated. Um, who here has worked in a negative work environment before? Uh, I'm kind of surprised there's not everybody's hands. <laughs> um, but I need to know where you work so I can uh, apply there. So. Um, it's uh, usually through like some harassment or bullying at work. Those are the commonly reported problems. Um, they can have a substantial adverse uh, impact on your mental health. Um, unemployment is a negative risk factor on mental health, uh, but returning or getting work, it has a positive impact. Um, negative working environment can lead to, as um, Chloe stated before, it can lead to physical and mental health problems, but also harmful use of substances or alcohol. Um, it can also lead to absenteeism and lo lost productivity. Uh, for every one dollar that's been put into a skilled um, treatment in a company, they see a common return of $4 um, in improved health and productivity. So it's a 400% return um, for any company that does invest in these kind of programs. So um, to move on to that, we don't want to present just or, or bring light to this uh, problem. We want to uh, potentially give you solutions, too, that you might be able to take back to your employer. Or if you are um, a lead in a company, maybe take these initiatives back. So some of the changes that you can do in your workplace, give your team flexibility. So uh, you want to invest in mental health in your workplace and you're not sure where to start, um, let the employees choose. So one option is uh, potentially a monthly stipend that can be used at their choice for therapy appointments, massages, meditation apps, uh, gym memberships. Uh, spa days, <laughs> um, and then uh, potentially healthier working hours. So we had talked to someone about um, how they were kind of drowning at work, and their supervisor recognized this and um, changed his work hours, and he was um, almost instantly happier and healthier. So everybody has like different rhythms. Some people are early birds, some people are night owls. Having that level of autonomy at your work um, sometimes really helps um, and resonates with the people, and it's uh, apparent in their productivity. So um, next slide, we talk about getting employee buy-in. And so there were several companies on Inc.'s 2019 best workplace list that said that they offer monthly and annual stipends, but employees don't always take advantage of these benefits, even the short-term ones. Um, short-term services for people struggling with uh, perhaps like addiction, 
or um, personal problems of some sort. And so only half of the employees were actually aware that they were um, given this benefit. So awareness to your employees is huge if you do offer these programs. And um, getting employee buy-in is easier in smaller companies usually because of the tight-knit culture that they have there. Um, and having leadership, again, as Chloe mentioned, that's open about their own struggles with mental health. So if you have, I mean, even if you're not in a position of leadership, just being open and vocal um, sometimes just helps um, everybody else. Employees that see that mental illness isn't shameful can be managed and more likely seek help before they're in crisis and uh, potentially lose their jobs. So next slide. So one of the other things an employer can do is making it easier to get help. So opening the workplace dialogue is one way and teaching coping strategies is another. You can go a long way in aiding employees' mental health, and um, sometimes people just also need professional treatment, though. So um, while most health insurance plans cover some mental uh, health care, therapy can be very expensive, um, even with the insurance. So um, one of the things that they're doing to close the gap is uh, companies are turning to online services. And then to the next point, they're actually bringing in-house professionals. Um, so one of the, uh, there's an Illinois-based accounting firm that uh, provides all of their employees with access to a psychologist on the company's dime and during the company time at their location. So it makes it super accessible for the employees to take advantage of. And the company um, also started bringing in a certified life coach to work with employees at least once a year. And it wouldn't be a talk at a cyber conference unless we mentioned metrics at some point. So <laughs> how would you measure that this is actually working? Um, and I mean, the, the programs sound good in theory, but you, it can be difficult to measure their success because how do you measure happiness? And um, there are a few things that you can do, uh, potentially track productivity, the quality of um, output, as well as the turnover rate and absenteeism. Next slide. So I told you I'd talk to you about mental health hackers a little bit. Um, I was privileged enough to be at DerbyCon 8, and it all began out of a tweet. Um, our illustrious CEO, Amanda Berlin, InfoSister, a lot of people know, know her as InfoSister on Twitter. Uh, she's just amazing, and she's spoken about mental health extensively. Um, she's done many talks at CyberCons about them. And she saw that this was a problem and she wanted to present a solution. So she went to the creators of, uh, or the, um, people who run DerbyCon, and they were super supportive, and they gave her a room, and they said, you know, have a mental health village. And um, she invited me to teach yoga, and, and I jumped on the chance uh, to go to Derby and be able to do this for her. And that's where it all began for us, was DerbyCon 8 in October of 2018. Um, it was such a success, and it was so well received by the community that we knew it had to be something. So she formed a board. Um, I think our board members are listed on the slides, so please um, go and uh, follow them on Twitter. And uh, by November, just the following month, she had us incorporated as a nonprofit. And by April of the following year, we were um, a 501c3 um, we re received our status on that, which was amazing. So our goal is to have hel hackers helping hackers, um, and we kind of say it's AA for mental health. Um, one of the things that we want to grow into, because right now we provide uh, mental health villages at various cons, and in our first year we did uh, cons in three countries and, and 10 in, in 10 different states. And upcoming in 2020, we're already committed or speaking to uh, 12 other cons. And what we do at our mental health village is we have uh, presentations and uh, discussions, um, yoga, like I've mentioned before. We have massage chairs, which people love. Who doesn't love getting a 15-minute massage in the middle of the day? <laughs> um, and then um, we have different tables set up. So there's like a fidget table, um, coloring, adult coloring books set up. We have a crafts table. Um, we had a session on paracord crafting, um, knitting, essential oils. There was a therapy dog that showed up that people really loved. Um, we filled a unicorn pool with like beads and people loved running their hands through it. It was, it was crazy. Um, but we want to be able to do this more and we want to be able to expand. 
And one of the things we want to do is there's a, a mental health first aid uh, training out there, and we want to be able to bring that to the hacker community. Um, it's basically CPR for mental health is the way um, that we like to look at it. Um, we want to make that more accessible. Uh, so we would love if everybody would want to get involved. There are definitely ways to donate, and we would love the support in that way, but we also would love it if you would volunteer, and you could do that through our website. Um, and also follow Mental Health Hackers on Twitter. Um, our handle's up there, Hacker, Hackers Health. And um, if you see us on, at cons, please come say hi and enjoy the Mental Health Village. We're there for you. And um, I just want to mention that I do have stickers and, and swag <laughs> afterwards for anybody who wants uh, them. Yes. <laughs> so just find me after. I absolutely love the fidgeting station. Yes. So the first time I found Mental Health Hackers was in B-Sides Austin. And I was like, there's so many things I can like play with while I was like waiting to get a massage. I was like, this is luxurious. Like I wish every conference had this because I could use a massage every time. But it, it made me feel really comforted uh, for sure. I think it lets you know that you're not alone. Yeah. Um, like I said, it's sensory overload, so it's nice to take that break, but it's also like a room of people who are just there for each other. That's what the discussions, like I think the first one at Derby 8, there was like, we went through so many boxes of tissue. <laughs> like there was just from everybody sharing their stories and there was just crying and it was great. It's very cathartic. <laughs> nice. Yeah, and I, and I first heard about uh, Mental Health Hackers actually on Twitter. And um, I think Amanda and the whole team and with Susan and everyone, they've done really exciting work. So I was really happy to see that people cared a lot to, uh, to put something together for people in the hacker community. Overall, we're really hoping that when you guys walk out of here that you kind of want to give back in a sense because we need to all come together to change what needs to be changed at this point. But most importantly, you do not know what each person is going through, so please be kind. And that means on Twitter. <laughs> I'm looking at everyone in here. Be nice on Twitter because you do not know how that's going to impact a person. So if, even if you want to troll, you want to have a snarky remark, that's cool and everything, but think about it before you press tweet. Um, we have a really good page for you, and I'm going to ask for everyone in this audience to take a photo of this. Um, I want you to share this everywhere. If anyone ever were to connect with you and be like, I'm dealing with a situation, I want you to send this photo to them. Post it on Facebook, post it on LinkedIn, post it everywhere you possibly can, because that is how we let people know about the resources that are available. Now, like I promised, we're going to stop the uh, recording. So if anyone wants to ask some questions, uh, don't worry. It's not being recorded. And if anyone asks any questions, please keep that within the room, meaning don't bring it out. Don't share it that this person did this or talked about this. Literally, just keep it in this room, please. And I know whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, and we're not in Vegas. But let's be real. Every time we're at Black Hat, people are taking photographs. OK. So 